what are we doing today? Well, we are doing some games VFX. So if we zoom around my Unreal scene, we're going to be making these beautiful butterfly particles, kind of linking back to what I said at the start that um, it's good to have a lot of tools in your arsenal. So this, this project here, this is uh, something I use to help my students. So if they're trying to figure something out, we normally debug it in here. We do some tests. This is for one student's um, spell effect that he's trying to do. We were just trying to think about how the transitions would work, various liquid materials and smoke and glass and all sorts, even some foliage where we were doing nice subsurface scattering. So the butterflies today, um, it's a very simple workflow um, or a very simple particle, I should say, but we've added some really cool elements in here. So we've got vertex animation to make the wings move. We've got a uh, randomized color. Um, when I'll talk through that when we get to it. Um, it's a small little detail that would add a lot to your scene. Um, and we're thinking about this as kind of like a, a background effect for a game. So maybe you've got a large open world and you just need a few butterflies that uh, flutter around your meadow. In this case, I've, I've grouped them up a lot just so we can see how the effect's looking and see how the collision's working and stuff. But um, if these were going to be in game, they would obviously be spread out in a more realistic way. And to that, to the same degree, these are also a background asset. So they're not super high detail. We're not spending loads of polygons. This is not something that would be for like a, a cut scene, for example, where you might have a real 3D model of the insect's body with all the legs and everything. Uh, these are just a simple incidental uh, background particle. So I've got a few slides to talk through some of the theory behind this. So the, the, the theme of the talk really is materials uh, for real-time visual effects. So we're making this particle system but primarily the work we're going to be doing is in Unreal's material graph. We're going to be doing the animation in the material graph. We're going to be doing the um, per instance randomization in the material graph. And I'm going to kind of fly through this demo. Um, if you want to follow along, it will be up on YouTube uh, soon after this, after this uh, webinar. So it, um, we will probably be going a bit too fast for you to follow along in the demo just because we've got to fit it all in one hour. So there's the effect as a GIF, but you've seen it, you've seen it in the engine. <clears throat> so what's kind of on the itinerary? Well, observing reference and planning, we're going to look at some reference of butterflies. Obviously, it seems basic, but it's one of the most important steps of our art workflow is looking at the thing we want to make. And you will be amazed how many students get caught up on forgetting to look at reference and working from their imagination. They think, I know what a butterfly looks like. I know what this plant looks like. I know what this object looks like. And then the result isn't realistic. And we've got multiple things to observe here. We've got the form, but we've also got the motion and capturing the motion and, and emulating the motion in a way that is both performant and somewhat believable. That's going to be the key. So the next thing is creating a pa channel packed texture. If you don't want, know what that means, don't worry, we're going to talk through it. Um, but this is a key step for optimization. We're going to have a little talk about how we optimize things for games. Um, if you are a potential VFX student or um, someone doing 3D animation, um, the, the optimizations needed for the real-time games workflow might be a bit new to you. So we're gonna talk through that and explain some of the key principles. We're gonna be modeling the mesh. So this is a mesh particle that uses an actual 3D model, a very simple one, but a 3D model nonetheless. Uh, we're going to be creating the animated material. So there's a little bit of maths involved. There's a little bit of shader manipulation stuff. We're going to be adding our randomization. So randomizing the color, randomizing the um, size and speed of our butterflies. And finally, we're going to be building the particle system. So key concepts. It's all just maths. So uh, Tom Hall, who teaches VFX at Escape, is famous for his... Uh, or maybe infamous for his saying it's just maths. Um, but in reality, that's nothing to be scared of. Even if you don't think you're a mathematically minded person, remember that this is digital art, this is CGI. Every single thing we see on our screen is mathematically defined. And we've, you know, every value of every pixel that, of, that you're looking at right now to see my presentation and my face, if it's on screen, I don't know if it's on screen. Um, those colors that you're seeing are defined by three numbers, right? RGB, red, green, and blue. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that and explain 
um, some of those concepts. So color is numbers, location is numbers, and then we're talking about the location of our meshes in our, in our space, in our game, coordinates, right, X, Y, Z. Um, the UV coordinates are numbers, so how we map our textures to our objects defined by numbers, and you may recognize this, this gradient if you've dabbled in, in game art at all before, this is a UV gradient. It's a, a one gradient running one way in the green channel and one gradient running one way in the red channel, and this defines how our textures get laid out. Um, and every pixel of our textures is a numerical value. So channel packing, I mentioned this a second ago that we're gonna be channel packing our textures. Um, you may know that images that we see on a computer screen are generally RGB and they're composed of three channels. You can see the channels in Photoshop, red, green, and blue. And what we're basically saying is using this classic parrot example, the three channels are saying how much red is in each pixel, how much green is in each pixel, and how much blue is in each pixel. So in actuality, the channels are three channels of black and white information that combine together to describe the color of every pixel. So you can see it's a lot lighter in the red channel on this image. And that's because this parrot is largely red. So there's more red information and less blue information apart from around his eye and around his wings where there's blue, uh, it's lighter in the blue channel. So, you know, a lot of these concepts there to help with your understanding, but you don't need to feel 100% comfortable with them straight away. So remember that we define the overall color of a pixel by balancing the amount of R, G, and B, uh, and, and that's in a range of zero to one. So a value of one, one, one is pure white and a value of zero, zero, zero is pure black. This example color, which is just, I just picked this color in the color picker in Unreal is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, right? And normally you'd have a really uh, random value in there like 0 0.24723, you know, when you're picking your colors manually, but I just, chose those values to see what the result was to help you understand that it's largely a blue color. So it's got more blue information than it has red information, for example. And that translates into the physical world. If you look really closely at the pixels of a screen, especially like an old screen, you can actually see that each pixel is emitting red, green, and blue light. And the, how those lights are lit up is defining the color of the pixel. So grayscale maps. Um, Channel packing was where we started, um, and that's what this is about. Um, we're, we're talking about this because we're gonna channel pack the textures for our butterfly to save on, on space. Basically, um, if we've got three black and white textures, it makes sense to pack them into the individual channels of an RGB image so that they cost less for our um, game engine to, to call them to render. So it's, it's partly about the file size Right, that three grayscale images is actually bigger than um, one channel packed RGB image. And also that the number of times the engine has to go, oh, I need that texture. Remember, find where the texture is in the memory and call it, called a draw call, um, is less if we have less textures. So often in games, if you've messed around with textures before, you'll have seen there's a base color or an albedo that looks like the color, but without any lighting on it. There's the normal map that's the funky blue and purple one that tells the engine how to light the surface. And this is a whole uh, kettle of fish learning about normal maps, but we don't need to do that today because we don't need one for our butterfly. And then finally, you might have seen textures that are just weird colors. And you think, what could this be for? Well, this is actually three individual maps packed together into one map. So here we've got the roughness map, which defines how rough or shiny the surface is, the ambient occlusion map, which tells the engine where those little shadows are going to go when you bake the lighting and the height map which we might use for tessellation or something uh, sometimes it's ambient occlusion roughness metallic for things that have metal on them and you need to tell the engine which bits are metal and which bits aren't um, in this case it's height so that's something to bear in mind and help with your understanding when it comes down the line to using our textures vertex animation so we are going to be using the world position offset node in unreal and this is how we're gonna move our butterfly's wings. Um, the material defines how the surface of the mesh is rendered, right? What we're seeing whenever we look at any mesh uh, is the material on its surface. Um, so because we can control all the elements of the surface, we can control what the color is, how rough it is, whether it's metallic, what the normal map looks like. We can also 
offset the surface because we can control where the surface is being rendered. That's what the world position offset node does. <clears throat> and that lets us do cool things like expand meshes or shrink them or just move them a little bit based on the material that's on them. So there's lots of uses for this, but one of the key ones is that it's a very cheap way to animate things. You may have seen this game, Abzu. Uh, Abzu is a very beautiful underwater game slash experience. I think it's it's debatable whether it's a game because it's very um, more like an exploration kind of a world to, to explore. But almost all the animation in this game is done with vertex animation or world position offset. Um, so world position offset is very common in all games for foliage wind, like grass moving in the wind or um, for, for example, these underwater plants, but they used it for a lot of things like fish moving and the water surface and all sorts of stuff. So finally, Niagara. Niagara is Unreal's new particle system. Uh, we previously were using Cascade and uh, I don't know if any of you use Cascade, but wow, is Niagara an upgrade. Loads of much better menus, um, much easier to use, really intuitive. Niagara's already been tested to create Fortnite FX, um, and they were using it basically for their game before it was released to Unreal Engine users. So it's really been battle hardened before it's even gone onto the uh, onto the version of Unreal that clients can use. Um, so yeah, we don't need to talk about the differences between Niagara and Cascade too much because honestly, um, all the problems with Cascade are now alleviated basically all the nested menus and messy interface and stuff is all tidy and it's all sorted one thing to mention just quickly is that the components of your particle systems in niagara are your systems which is the the main thing the systems what you place in the world and that has your emitters in it which are emitting the particles there's the emitters inside the system these are containers for modules and the modules are these little inputs where you can control your particles um, some info on Niagara is that the tooltips are really good. So if you're trying to learn Niagara, and you're interested in becoming a game VFX artist and you want to play around with it, there's great tutorials online. There's great documentation, uh, especially Epic's own documentation. Um, but also if you just mouse over anything, it kind of explains what it does. So some more info here, uh, Unreal Engine documentation for Niagara. T. Hall VFX for Niagara. He's a, a tutor who works for Escape doing the doing VFX stuff. Game Dev Outpost, uh, un, unaffiliated YouTube channel with a really useful playlist, and Real Time VFX Forum. So I'll make sure that these links get put in the chat at the end of the at the end of the webinar. Cool. So let's close this down. Where do we start with an effect like this? Well. I'm going to start with the texture, I think. And that's because we're going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting with um, the material and the texture. And the mesh, it's basically just a plane, right? Um, I'm not going to spoil too much about how we do the effect. Um, you'll see as we go along. But what we need to do is find a good source image. So I'm going to open up uh, a new tab. And let's search for butterfly. So one useful, useful tip for students, if you're looking for um, images to work from, um, not as reference necessarily, because you can use any image as reference, but if you want to actually use the image in your work, you need to make sure you have the right to do that. So if we go to images, we don't know the usage rights on all these images. But if we go to tools, usage rights, and we select Creative Commons license, we should be free to use any of these images for our um, studies. So this is the image I've used in the past. Uh, and one thing to note about butterflies is that this is a natural pose for the butterfly's wings, right? Straight out to its sides. This is not. The only time you see a butterfly like this is when it's been posed uh, dead for a, for a collection. Right, so these, these wings are way stretched forward just to show off all the wing material, but actually the butterfly never puts its wings in that position itself. So if you wanna make sure your work's realistic, just make sure you're picking up on little things like that. So this one, this is perfect. We've got a nice HD image of this wing, which we can use um, 
to to start working from. So let's make a new folder on the desktop and call this webinar. So I know know what I'm doing. Butterfly image. I got Photoshop already open because I want to make sure we're going at a good pace. I don't want to be waiting for stuff to load. Um, and we're going to start making our base texture. So first thing to note is we only need half of this, right? Both wings are the same. Why would we include both wings when we could just mirror our same texture on both sides? Saves us time, saves us resolution. So what we actually need is a square crop. I'm just using shift on my uh, rectangle selection tool to make sure it stays a square. Then I'm going to switch to the crop tool and confirm that crop. And actually that's pretty close to what I want already. Maybe I will actually copy the whole thing. I'm gonna make a new image, a new uh, scene, sorry. And we don't need 2K for this. I think we could do a 512 by 512. 2K is usually the limit for game textures, but um, we wanna make sure that our texture res for such a small thing as a butterfly isn't big. And to be honest, probably in a game, I'd do this at, at 256 by 256. I wouldn't go all the way to 512, but for the sake of this demo, let's do it at 512. I'm gonna half him down the body. We need half of the body. So I'm just gonna rotating the image to get that. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is mask out the parts we don't need. So in this case, I'm, it doesn't have to be super precise because we're not gonna be seeing this from really close. I'm going to use the polygon lasso tool. It's a quick way to make a good selection on something. Remember that, consider the use case, right? If you're making something for a cinematic that it's going to be centimeters from the camera, yes, you give it all the detail in the world. If you're doing something quick, that's a background asset. Um, don't be sloppy, but it doesn't have to be 100% perfect. So I'm just going to quickly cut this out. I'm doing this the opposite way. I'm cutting, I'm cutting out the bit I don't need rather than cutting in the bit I do need. I'm going to just select, modify, uh, sorry, select inverse, and then hit the mask button on the layer stack. And I've got a nice black mask around my layer. I'm going to scale it up a tiny bit. Uh, actually, firstly, I'm gonna hit crop, press enter, apply the crop. So it's just deleted all of the image outside of the frame, which I don't need. I'm just gonna scale this up until it fills the, the texture pretty much. That menu is popping up right in front of my tools. Hit apply. Uh, and then lastly, we don't need the color. We're gonna define the color inside our material. So I'm gonna make a um, hue saturation layer on top, turn the saturation way down. Cool. So that is our butterfly base color uh, or base shape, I should say. What we also need is a separate image for the um, mask. And I'm going to do that by making a new grayscale of the same size, 1020, oh, sorry, 512 by 512, it should be. Hit create, and I'm going to copy the mask. So I'm going to alt click on this mask to bring it into my view. Control A, Control C, Control V. There we go. So the reason I'm making these separate is that I'm going to channel pack all these images together. I started this as a, a, a color image, an RGB image, but I actually need to convert it to grayscale. Now it's black and white. So I'm going to go image mode. Well, actually, I could do that, or I could make this the channel pack texture. Yeah, let's do this as a channel pack texture. Um, so I'm gonna take my mask and I'm gonna open up the channels palette. So you'll notice this is RGB and we have three channels of info, but this is a black and white image. So the same thing is in every single channel. What we're actually gonna do is we're gonna paste this mask we just made into the, um, the green channel. So now we've got this, sorry, this image in the red channel, this image in the green channel and the same image in the blue channel as we had in the red channel. Now, in many cases, we might pack 
three things together, right? Because we've got three channels. And I know that we're going to need a gradient to animate our wing. So I'm going to make a new 512 by 512 once again. And I'm going to use the gradient tool. So I'm going back to the layers palette, hit the new adjustment layer, hit gradient. And I'm going to pick a black to white gradient as a starting point. We want the wings to beat in um, a pattern radiating out along, radiating sideways, right? So um, don't worry too much about what we're going to do with this. I'll explain when we get there. But what I'm going to do is make a gradient at 180 degrees or even zero degrees actually, I guess, because by default it's at 90, so going up, up to the bottom, it doesn't matter. And what we want is a regular wing beat. So if you imagine this texture was scrolling, we would get black value going to a white value, going to a black value immediately. So what we actually want is something that smoothly transitions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this part of the gradient to location 50%. I'm gonna make a new gradient input at zero, and it's gonna be a white value at zero. So our gradient now goes white to black to white again. You can imagine if this thing was scrolling sideways, we would just see a black stripe seamlessly fading into a white stripe, seamlessly fading into a black stripe. And I'll explain what's happening with that when we get there. So last thing to do is merge this, control A, control C, going back to our pack texture, opening up the channels and pasting this into blue. So now we've got this weird image, right? What, what are we gonna do with this? It's green and blue and all different colors. Well, remember, we are going to be using these masks individually. So it doesn't matter how this RGB looks. What matters is how this layer looks, how this layer looks, and how this layer looks. So what we've got is our base texture, our opacity mask, and our wing beat gradient, all packed into one 512 texture. That's just going to be one easy lookup, easy draw call for our engine. So I'm going to export this, save as, go to my new folder on the desktop. Um, Targa is the format we tend to use for games. There's a couple of options, but Targa is one of the best lossless, uh, best quality to file size ratios. So we're going to name this with a games naming convention, T underscore butterfly underscore textures or underscore maps, I guess. T stands for texture. Uh, when we name stuff in the engine, we always name things um, based on a convention. So T for textures, M for materials, SM for static meshes, SK for skeletal meshes, um, just so it's easy to find things in the, uh, in the engine. Uh, the target options we leave at default, 24 bits per pixel, and um, we don't need to change that. Okay into unreal we go let's make a new folder for the webinar this is unreal engine by the way in case you haven't used it before it's free uh, i recommend if you are interested in making games unreal engine is the place to start it used to be hot competition between unity and unreal but these days unreal is the one um, i think it's definitely the place to be so first thing i'm going to do is just import there's a couple of ways to import we could go to the add import button Go to the import to this location. Easier way, in my opinion, just drag it in into the content browser down here. Here's our texture. There's one thing we need to do. If I open the texture, there is a checkbox called sRGB. This is a common student mistake. If you mouse over it, this should be unchecked if using the alpha channels individually as masks. If you remember what we've been talking about, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're, we're not interested in this compiled RGB image. We're interested in This, this, and this. So we, we turn off sRGB and hit save. Um, it's a different type of compression. It's cheaper, sRGB, um, if you just need the, the, the color output, but we need the different channels. OK, so the next thing to do is make a mesh for this. I've got Maya open already. What I'm going to do is create a free image plane. So image planes are there for displaying reference on. If we go to create free image plane, why is it free? Not because it costs nothing, but because it's not constrained to any camera. 
it is in the world. We can move it around. We can make it bigger or smaller as we wish. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to select it. Go to the attribute editor. By the way, this is Maya. Uh, if you're going to study at Escape, get used to Maya because uh, pretty much all the modules use Maya. Um, love it or hate it, I think, is uh, is kind of the the approach most people take. So here there's an image name browse option in the attribute editor. I'm just going to point to my file I just made on the desktop. And we're just going to use this as a starting point. In fact, what am I doing? I don't need a free image plane. I just need a plane. Um, so we're actually going to make a texture of this image. So different approach. Right click. I've created a plane from the primitives thing. Right click. <clears throat> Assign favorite material. I'm going to make a new Lambert material. I'm going to hit the checkbox here and I'm going to browse to a file and I'm going to browse to my butterfly maps. You can't see anything on here, even though I just assigned a material and made that image, the texture for the material. And that's because the uh, display textures in the viewport checkbox wasn't enabled. I'm going to turn this on and this mesh is going to become our butterfly. Just checking how we're doing for time. We may need to speed up a little bit. So how do we check scale? Well, how do I know how big this is, right? This could be, I know my grid settings, but sometimes you don't. I don't know whether this is one meter, whether this is one centimeter. There is an easy way to check, which is to just go to Windows, General Editors, Content Browser. Um, you'd have to expand all these collapsed menus, but you would go into um, Examples Modeling, Sculpting Base Meshes, Bipeds. There are humans in here. Don't select character male or select him at your own risk. We're going to use humanbody.ma. Right now, a butterfly is a little big, you might agree. So all I'm going to do is scale it down. Currently, my pivot point is set to the middle of the mesh or the, the right edge of our mesh, i.e. the middle of our butterfly when it's mirrored. Um, you can move the pivot by pressing D, and you can snap it to grid by holding X or snap it to points by holding V. Uh, either would work in this case. We're just going to scale it down. We want to make sure we're scaling it from that side. Otherwise, it's going to scale uh, away from the center of our world, which we don't want. And we're just going to scale it down until it looks roughly butterfly sized. So, you know, just under the palm of the hand size, I guess. We can, we can stylize it a bit, make it pretty big because it's a video game. And then we can delete the man. We know as long as we don't change the scale of this, it's going to work for us. So... We are going to be doing vertex animation. Um, the UVs, right? Uh, if you don't know what UVs are, thankfully, we don't need to cover it too much in detail in this webinar because we're using the planes UVs and it's already pr projected correctly. Hopefully, we don't need to mess with it, but just understand that um, we're going to be mirroring this so that whatever happens anywhere on the one side happens the same on the other side. We're doing vertex animation, so we need vertices to move. If we tried to animate this with vertex animation as it is now, um, these vertices might move. Flap, flap, flap. But that's not going to look very good, right? The, the motion needs to be more natural. It needs to deform the wing. Um, so we need divisions to do that. So I'm going to just add a few divisions in by going to Mesh Tools, Insert Edge Loop. In the settings, I'm going to make sure it's set to multiple edge loops with equal multiplier and pick a number. Let's try six. Select the edge and hit enter. And we've got divisions going along our butterfly's wing. One last division I'm going to add manually at the um, join between the wing and the body. And then we need to minimize our overdraw. What do I mean by minimizing our overdraw? Well, this part I should say this part is all going to be masked out because it's black in our opacity mask. But it is expensive for the engine to render transparent materials over other transparent materials. So we want to make sure that we minimize the amount of um, mesh that's going to be not needed. So we're going to do that by, we could either add some edge loops in or go to our move tool, select the verts, make sure in tool settings we turn on preserve UVs. If we don't, you're going to see this is deforming, but if we turn on preserve UVs, we can just move our points in. 
And we're trying to strike a balance here between too much geo, too many uh, vertices, and too much transparency overdraw. So a bit of transparency overdraw is fine. We don't want to add like a million vertices just to get rid of you know this tiny bit of, of overdraw here. I also want to keep my um, verts relatively evenly spaced so the animation looks smooth. We don't want to have one big chunk of wing that doesn't animate as smoothly as the rest uh, because we were too obsessed with getting rid of all the transparency. One thing I didn't mention at the time is that I didn't keep the antennas. These would be so thin that they would probably be rendered under a pixel wide in our Unreal scene. And as a result, we wouldn't see them and it would just be adding cost to our mesh, to our uh, particle system, I should say. OK, so I'm happy with that. That is looking like a decent base mesh, very simple. Might be a bit high poly, like maybe if we were in a real game studio and they were worried about, you know, the VFX artist sadly has to be the one who pays the price on poly count um, and optimizes their work more, but we're doing this for fun. Um, so we don't have to worry too much. All we need to do is mirror this mesh, mirror. The settings always are messed up to begin with. We're gonna do this on world because this is the center of the world, the zero, zero. We're gonna turn the mesh the merge uh, threshold way down because for some reason it's merging any verts that are 45 centimeters apart from each other or millimeters. And you should see that we have, if I move this face, two sides that aren't attached together because I turned the merge threshold to zero, 0 0.1. Now we have two sides that are attached together. We have one mesh. Um, the UVs are the same on both sides, right? So what's on this wing is also happening on this wing. Cool, let's speed into Unreal because the time is disappearing. So I'm gonna export this as well. Webinar, FBX export, SM. Remember I said static mesh underscore butterfly. I'm going to bring the butterfly into Unreal. Uh, a few things to change in the FBX import settings. Uh, just click the drop down. make sure that, well, it doesn't matter in this case, combine meshes you may or may not want on. The other thing is sometimes it thinks it's a skeletal mesh and you have to uncheck that. Uh, the important one is do not create materials and do not import textures because it's going to just make a material you don't need. I'm going to put this in the world so we can see it. And we are going to start on the material. M underscore butterfly. So first thing, we need our texture. This is basically the only texture we're going to need, apart from some color gradients. I'm going to plug, firstly, the R into base color. And we're going to see we have our grayscale texture on the uh, the, pla the preview plane here. What's cool is we can select this butterfly mesh in our uh, content browser, go to the material editor and hit the teapot. And now we're previewing the texture on our mesh. Sadly, our mesh is tiny, so it's kind of hard to zoom to and we can't see it through the grid. So here's our, our mesh with our material on it. I've plugged the grayscale output, which is just the black and white texture of the butterfly I made into base color. Opacity and opacity mask are grayed out. That's because this is currently a opaque shader. We need to select the output node, go to the blend mode and set it to masked. Then I can take my mask, which was in the green channel, and plug it into opacity mask. There we go, immediately the edges from around our butterfly are gone. I'm gonna hit apply. And then we need to start thinking about our animation. So let's quickly open up. Oh, they're in a different folder. Let's quickly open up the previous version of the butterflies material. And you will notice 
a, a bit is going on with the vertex animation here. So we have a texture scrolling in world space. How are we doing that? Well, we're using a panel node, vertex normals, and it's all going into the world position offset input. So firstly, we need to sample this texture again. So the cool thing is we can just copy and paste this node. We've already sampled this pack texture in our material. So it doesn't matter if we paste it again, this is not adding cost to our material or not much cost. It's adding instructions, but it's barely adding. It's not adding another draw call. So it's really cheap to sample the same texture twice. We need our gradient input, which I'm just going to preview on this multiply. So you can see what it looks like. It shows us red. And that's just the way Unreal displays vector one information, but this is a white to black to white gradient. What we need to do is use the panna node. So the panna node allows us to move our textures across their UVs. You'll see exactly what's happening once I plug it in and put a value in X. You'll notice this whole thing scrolling, but if we're looking at just our blue channel, we've just got this gradient scrolling. So lastly, let me just put this on the other window. So now we've got this thing scrolling. We need to add it to our well position offset. But there's one thing we need to do before that. Um, we need to pick which direction we're going to move this. And what we're actually going to be using is our vertex normals. So we can actually display our vertex normals really quickly in, um, in uh, Maya. Remember I said that we need vertices to do vertex animation. Well, if I go to display polygons, vertices, and then I go to display polygons, vertex size. Sorry, display polygons, <laughs> vertex normals, display polygons, normals size. And just turn these up to like three. These green lines, I don't know how well they show up on the stream against the, the uh, background. There we go. These green lines are the normals, i.e. the direction of our vertices. And this is basically telling the engine this surface is facing this way, i.e. straight up, so that the engine knows how to light, um, light this. What we're going to be doing is animating the mesh in these directions, because we have these directions built in. Um, and that's really cool, because for a simple plane like this, we don't actually need to use the vertex normals, but we do need a direction um, for something more complicated, like if you're animating a round shape, the normals are going to be very different and more complicated than this. Um, but you can still use them to animate it. So in this case, all we're going to do is use our vertex normals input, vertex normal world space. And we're going to multiply our result with the vertex normals. And plug this into World position offset. And immediately we've got a result. It might not be quite what we're looking for, but this is animating. So what's going on here? Well, we're saying here's our vertex normals. They're a direction. And we're going to multiply them by this value. Remember that in the intro, I said that everything's numbers, right? What is this black? in our texture, this is a value of zero represented as a, as a color. What is this white? This is a value of one. So we're actually multiplying our vertex normals between zero and one. So what we actually want to do is multiply this, and then we can make a parameter. And this parameter is multiplying the, the values in our texture. And this is actually going to control the intensity of our animation. So if I turn this up, it gets more and more intense until it's ridiculous, right? So we need to strike a balance. I think in this case, 
something like four. So you might notice that something's off, right? This is not how butterfly wings work. The whole wing needs to move kind of in one go. Um, as I said, we were going to look at reference, but we were so short on time, didn't actually have time to look through butterfly video. But um, basically, if we did look at the reference, we would see that the wing doesn't be along like this ripple. It needs to be one movement. And we can do that by increasing the size of this uh, gradient texture or actually, yeah, decreasing its tiling so that it's bigger um, relative to the size of our mesh. So what we can do is we can use a texture coordinate and we can multiply that. And I think you'll see what's happening if I make a parameter here and I call it tiling and I set it to one. Right now there's no change, but watch inside the texture sampler. If I set this to two, the texture's tiling twice. That's made the effect worse, right? This is the opposite of what we want. What we actually want is to scale this by, I don't know, 0 0.5 or even less, 0 0.3. So it's hard to see what's happening here because we can see all three channels. If I just pull a multiply from this, and we preview the multiply, you can see the gradient is just a lot bigger, right? It's taking, it's filling up the wing. One thing we could do is we could multiply this into the base color and that's gonna allow us to see, so actually this output, it's gonna allow us to see what our result is looking like on the base color. So there you can see the gradient moving across the wings. That Those values that you're seeing in the base color now are the same values that are going into our world position offset to animate the wing beats. So we can turn up the strength now that the size is bigger. So that's cool. We've got a flapping effect. Let's quickly make this material two-sided so we can see it from below. That's better. And let's remove the multiply from the base color. That was just for debug purposes. And then last thing is to have some control over the speed, right? So you'll notice we have a speed input here, but vector two speed is actually for these inputs. We can make a vector two, a number with two channels of information, plug that in and say, we want this to be going 10, 10, 20, if we wanted to go berserk. Yeah, <laughs> but that's not what we want. What we actually want is to speed up or slow down this value we've already put in. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're actually going to use time. So time, this is game time, i.e. it's not checking the time on the clock, 1851. God, we are running out of time, I should say. I wish I could slow down time for this webinar like I can in here. This is game time or engine time. So this is just a number that increases ever so, well, it increases exponentially as time goes on, but it's not relating to clock time. The thing is that we, as the game artists, can control time by multiplying this output. If I use a quick debug scalar values, we can preview and see what time is doing, projected weirdly on our butterfly mesh. Currently, my engine time is at 4,508 seconds, uh, and this amount of decimal places, that's a ridiculous amount of decimal places. Um, this is why sometimes games run into errors if they've been running for a long time, that various things are calculated off game time. And if game time gets really, really high and you start getting rounding errors because you're in the gazillions of seconds, um, you can start running into bugs. Um, same thing for like ex the example of Minecraft worlds being messed up when you get like a certain number of million blocks away from the spawn, that you're getting to really high numbers, you're getting rounding errors and the computer's starting to... Uh, make mistakes. Cool, a little bit of trivia if you like numbers. Um, so what to do with this time? Well, we can make a scalar value called uh, flap speed. This is a multiplier of time. We're speeding up or slowing down the game time that's being fed into this panel. So currently it's a one. We put it into the time input. We hit OK. And we can speed this up. He's going for it. Or we can slow it down if he's just chilling. 
Oh, so we're going to put this to like two. Flap strength up to eight. I really think we're going to have to cut down our plan for, the, for this webinar because I don't think I'm going to get through all the content, sadly. Um, so do we do more materials or do we move on to Niagara? I think the content was materials. So we will finish up the material rather than jumping straight into Niagara. Maybe I'll do another webinar for Niagara or um, I can release, I can release a video alongside this to, um, to complement it. So we've made our flying animation. Fantastic. How are we going to do the color? I'm going to really quickly talk about gradient mapping and we don't have time to make the materials ourselves, but we do have, uh, where's my, where's my gradient? So here is a bunch of gradients. Um, I made these and I would have talked through how to make them if we had a bit more time, but basically I've based these off butterfly colors. So you may recognize the color, uh, this, I was going to say this orange one, but I don't know where I got the pink from this orange. There's like the emperor butterfly, the blue one. Basically I picked the most common types of butterflies. If I turn off creative commons licenses, I've got this one. Uh, I've got this one, this blue and black one and the, the nice, uh, this one with the eye, the eye patterns on it. I've made these gradients based on how the colors are laid out on the butterfly. Um, and this is linking back to what I said at the start that, uh, how we lay out our textures is defined by numbers, right? This is a texture coordinate node. This is that gradient I was talking about. What do we actually have in here? We have a gradient running from, from zero to one on the green axis and from zero to one on the red axis. These colors and these numbers define how our textures are mapped. So we can do the same thing. We can do a bit of trickery. What's normally going into a texture is the texture coordinate gradient, right? That goes into the UVs. If I mask it and I show what the red gradient is doing, the red gradient is saying, if the pixel is darker, then it needs to be mapped to the left side of the image. If the pixel is lighter, it needs to be mapped to the right side of the image. We can trick it by putting our mask into a gradient. So, this mask I'm using is our red channel. Yeah, it looks like this. It's got dark pixels and it's got lighter pixels. What happens when those go into a gradient is that I've got a different gradient. So let's go, let's go with my rainbow. Oh, I don't have it. Damn. Oh, there we go. So here's a rainbow. If we plug our texture into the UVs, the output we get is actually this gradient mapped to the values in our image. So where it's darker on the image, it's more towards the left. It's going to the, um, to the uh, purple. And if it's, if it's lighter, it's going towards the red. So we can use the gradients I've made Butterfly multi gradient to define the base color of our material. Now, currently, this looks a bit weird. And the reason is that we've said how far to the, between the left and the right it needs to go, but we haven't had said how far up or down. So, what we actually need to do is append. And append is going to take our scalar one inputs and combine them together to make a uh, make a vector two. If we put an input in here, this value is controlling how far along the gradient it goes. 
and this value is controlling how far up the gradient it goes. So this allows me to pick between these four gradients I've made in the shader. So we could do 0 0.1 0 .1 is going to be, let's duplicate this so we can see. 0 0.1 is going to be up there. 0 0.3 is going to be there. 0 0.6 is going to be this gradient here. And 0 0.8 will bring us down to this gradient. So if I, for example, was to put time, um, uh, frac, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking just the decimal point of my time value. So this is just a, the output's going to be a number that goes between 0 and 1. And I'm just going to put that into B. You should see our butterfly is changing colors as this append scrolls through all my gradients I've made. So how this works in the scene is that we have all these butterflies and a, a parameter feeds in from the, um, from the particle system saying, when I spawn a particle, what number should I give? And it just gives a random number between zero and one. And we use that to control the color of our butterflies. So we're one minute away from the end and there was a lot I should have covered that I didn't. So I think uh, if I do this again, I will make sure or we speed along a bit quicker at the start, but hopefully that was helpful. I've covered some principles of vertex animation and some principles of gradient mapping. I hope I've helped you understand how all the stuff we see in on our screens is defined by numbers. And as artists, we can control those numbers to make our artwork. Um, obviously, there's more to do to this, to get from this stage to this stage. Um, I can show you what the material looks like in its finished form. And we can just talk through it a little bit before the session ends. So we have got dynamic parameter here and here. This is the same thing. We just I just put a different one up here because I didn't want to have my spaghetti strands coming all the way across everything. This is the input that feeds information from our particle system into the material. This is the stuff we did in the lesson. So making our flapping wings. In this case, the texture is separate, not packed. Here's our masks. Um, the reason they weren't packed in this one is that we had, got that things right in the way, is that we had uh, an extra mask in here for the wing white bits if we wanted to color them differently. In the end, I, I didn't use it. Uh, and then another thing I've added is subsurface color. Uh, in this case, subsurface color just means that when you see light through an object, you get like a nice glowing effect, kind of like if you shine a torch in your hand and it gets that red glow, as you also see through leaves, right? That subsurface scattering, shining light through the leaves. So um, the differences here are basically, we've got all these things saying that every time I spawn a butterfly, I would like to randomize the strength of the flapping, the speed of the flapping and the size of the wing beats and also offset the time. So you'll notice that none of these butterflies are flapping at the same time as each other. We've had to fake a lot of that randomness in the shader. Cool, so that was a little rushed introduction to uh, animating stuff in the material. Hopefully it was helpful to you guys.